Hi, I'm Leon Gorin, president of PEO Leadership, a peer-to-peer -peer leadership advisory firm. We're an amazing community of CEOs, presidents, and senior executives. Ask yourself, are you learning as fast as the world is changing? It's time for Ontario business leaders to band together for counsel and support. It's time for you to tap into the business wisdom of our peer groups and unlock new ways to grow. I want you to come out of this COVID crisis a better leader and your organization ready for what's next. Take the first step at peo-leadership.com. Welcome to the Way Forward PO Leadership's live webcast series. If you're joining us for the first time and you're CEO or president, business owner, and or corporate executive, looking to grow your leadership capabilities and performance, and of course, grow your business, you've landed in the right spot today. What you're going to experience this morning is one of our many PO community events where we invite various thought leaders from around the world to join us to discuss some of the opportunities and challenges that our members are facing. These community events, uh, the one you'll enjoy today, is really one leg of a three-legged stool in terms of delivering on our promise, which is to help leaders realize their goals and objectives for themselves and their organization. The other two legs which you won't experience today are really the first one being uh, an executive advisor. So being assigned to an advisor who sort of will walk the journey with you in terms of what success looks like to you, both from your, well, not both, but from your business, from your health, from your wealth, from your family career. Set the stage, understand where you are today, and sort of go along the journey and keep you on that straight path as you're moving forward. The second leg, which you, you don't get to experience today, is the idea of a shared peer-to-peer -peer advisory board. So that same executive advisor, is, you can imagine, is the chair of that board. But the board that you belong to is made up of leaders, similar peers. So if you're running a multinational organization, you're typically in a group with multinational organizations. You're running an entrepreneur organization, you're in a group with a bunch of entrepreneurs. It is a shared peer advisory board. The door closes, everyone's on an, on an NDA. And the idea is how can we help and challenge each other to push ourselves forward from point A to point B? How do we leverage the collective wisdom around the table? And how do we take away that feeling around loneliness? We've all heard the term in terms of, you know, when you lead, it's lonely to be at the top. You can talk to your management team, you can talk to your stakeholders, but you can't necessarily share everything with them. So that board is an enabler in terms, and these boards meet on a regular basis to really allow every member there to push each other and to move each other forward. At our organization today, some of the members, just give you some idea, represent some of Canada's strongest leaders for almost every industry. They lead both Canadian SMEs and large multinational organizations. Our leaders understand the value and importance of being able to connect and think with each other. As I, as I mentioned, they all work successfully to trying to achieve their personal goals and those of their organizations. Listen, after our session today, I urge you, Take a read, head over to our website, po-leadership.com, take a read, and I'm more than happy, or anybody in our organization would be more than happy to talk to you a little more about the, about the process, what we're trying to do, and to see whether or not we could get you involved. All right, now, one last thing before I get the session underway, and here's how it's going to unfold. Stefan's going to do, we got Stefan and Joe here, and I'll introduce them properly, but you're going to hear about a 30-minute presentation for them on the customer, obviously, in terms of that's their area of expertise. During that presentation, I asked, there's a group chat function here. Please post your questions as we're going. We will take Q&A at, at about the 30 minute point. I'll start to open it up. And then I'll also ask you if I can see who posting the question, which I do believe we can. I'll ask you to come off mute and to ask the question directly. All right, so let's get going. We're very excited to welcome both Joe Jackman, President and CEO of Jackman Reinvents, and Stefan Reed, Vice President of Engagement. With Joe at the helm, this company has led some of the most inspired brand transformations of the 21st century. You'll recognize many of the companies they've been associated and they've been involved with, such as Loblaws, Dave & Buster's, and Walgreens, and sort of naming a few. In 2020, Joe released his first book, The Reinventionist Mindset, unveiling a unique, human-centric approach to corporate transformation. He effectively shows us how to thrive in an era of disruption. Now, it's kind of interesting. He, he put the book out in January of 2020. The timing was kind of a little suspicious there. He got it dead on. 
Um, he starts by representing change as a force to be embraced. I visited their website and I love their opening statement. When everything is changing, the bold see opportunity. All of us are now rethinking what we value, who we trust, and how we spend our time and money. The moment to understand change, sharpen your strategy, and refresh how you engage with your customers is now. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I hand you the mic. Thank you so much, Leon, for the uh, kind intro introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm a big fan of um, your work, Leon, and, and that of your team and the PEO organization. Uh, I know, um, it, you know there's a lot of value in the work you do, so uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, my name is Joe Jackman. I'm the CEO of Jackman Reinvents, and I'm here with my colleague, Stefan Reed, and I'll turn it over to Stefan just to say hello, and uh, he's gonna walk through the presentation, and uh, we'll, we'll get uh, some, some questions forming, and then we'll get at those in the back half, as Leon said. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, so as Joe and Leon both mentioned, uh, my name is Stefan Reed. Uh, I'm a VP of engagements uh, at Jackman, and what that means is I split my time uh, leading engagements with our clients uh, on the ground, and I'm also responsible for our thought leadership, and we're going to be sharing some of that output with you today. Uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to go as quickly as I can, and I do speak fast, through a set of findings, insights, and implications for a new tool in, in, in our arsenal at Jackman called the Human Insights Study. Um, and what that does is it allows us to track customer attitudes and values over time and how they've shifted and morphed in response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and everything else that's happening in, in the world uh, right now. So we're going we're gonna to showcase for you how we think about um, consumers in our work and how getting under the, the hood of their values and attitudes and what's changing can unlock insights to drive new levels of customer engagement. And particularly how doing that right now is critical to shaping, shaping your um, reaction as the world begins to open back up. So there's a ton of detail uh, in the study itself, in the reports. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of it today in this format, but if there's anything that piques your interest, uh, as Joe and Leon both mentioned, either ask us the question um, or follow up with us afterwards. We're happy to share the reports uh, and dig into the detail with you. So with that as sort of table setting, I'm gonna dive in and go. Okay, so if anyone here is on social media, you'd be forgiven for thinking you know, about a month ago that everyone was baking, sewing masks, uh, aggressively jogging down the sidewalk. And look, since we built this presentation, the world has moved on so quickly and you know, very positively into a, a meaningful and important engagement with civil rights and anti-racism education. And all of a sudden that was beginning to, to dominate social media as well. And there's no doubt that you know, engagement in these activities, the level of it has shifted. And you know, very thankfully so in the case of anti-racism. But we also have to acknowledge that you know, beyond the headlines, the, the range of reactions and changes in behaviors in response to you know, particularly the pandemic is in fact quite varied and diverse. And you know, I, I say that, but the media and the business press, well, they're, they're just as guilty, right, as, as social media of kind of hyping up the, the one size fits all consumer insights. So you know, it's, it's either a story about a monolithic block of quote unquote consumers, or you know, slightly better, they'll talk about millennials or Gen Z or you know, younger Americans you can see on the screen here. And look, I get it, for media digestibility, to get the eyeballs, to get the clicks, it's simplifying things down in this way makes a lot of sense. But as business leaders, you know, we know that's not the way that the world of consumers you know, really works. And that's the essence of the massive challenge that I think is facing all of us as business leaders today. Right? There's so much change happening in our daily lives, in our shopping behaviors, in our thoughts about the future, and, and even the fundamental relationship we have with entrenched systems that kind of everything is up for grabs right now. Consumers are in play like they never have been before. Every behavior, attitude, and relationship they have is shifting in some subtle way. And that means every business and, and every brand and every industry, there's shifts and there's going to be a lot in play. I'm just going to tell a very quick story to illustrate my point. You know, the other day I was having a discussion with a former colleague, and we got to talking about our kids. Uh, my son just turned five months old today. And so he was, my colleague was asking me, you know, what has, uh, what it's like to be raising a baby right now. 
And candidly, like it's a, it's a little bit weird, you know, for basically the first five months of my son's life, he didn't really get to see other people except on the occasional Zoom call, which he absolutely hates. You know, we couldn't take him to baby classes. We couldn't pile him on the floor with a bunch of other kids. You know, we couldn't even really let his grandparents hold him. And so the thing that shifted up for us as parents, though, is, is more than that. It's, you know, if, if we as a society were questioning how we work, how we interact, how we shop, and even more importantly, things like you know, the role of the police, of community, how the economy works, and just sim simply taking a look at how life in general works, then for me as a parent, my assumptions about what parenting looks like, all of a sudden they're on the table in a way that, you know, if you'd asked me before, you know, in January, I wouldn't have been able to articulate. So me and my wife are actively right now taking a new look and revisiting how we think about how we plan to school our kid, what daycare means for us, even little things like the type of toys and foods we plan to give him. There's more possibility than we've had before because we're able to question things in a way that we weren't simply weren't doing before the pandemic. Because not just the world has changed, but my attitudes and my wife's attitudes about some pretty fundamental things about what's possible, well, those have changed as well. And so my point is this, right? Even as we start to see people reverting some behaviors back to things that look at like pre-pandemic behaviors, the world has moved on. The consumers have changed. Not everyone's changed in the same way, but a lot of that is not gonna go back in the bottle. So my job today and our job is to show you how we at Jackman tackle this and how we can help you and help clients get to an understanding of what's going on that strikes the perfect balance between those headlines or trends that we just saw, which you, know, you can't really react to those. They're not useful, but you also can't get to the level of the nuance of the individual shift. It's just too complex, it's not workable. So we're gonna show you the middle ground so you as business leaders can pivot your strategies to what's actually changing for consumers and gain new engagement in a way that you know, it's nuanced, but it's actually gonna be workable and manageable. One last thing to level set before we dive in. Um, broadest possible terms, right? As I'm sure you all know, when we segment consumers, when we think about grouping them, there are three different ways that this is typically done, by demographics, by occasions, or by attitudes. And each of these does have a role. You need demographics to inform marketing tactics, media buy, et cetera. You need occasions so you can demonstrate you know, the, the right use cases and show up at the right time to interact with your consumer. But at the level we're gonna talk at today, at the level of strategy, at the level of understanding how consumers relate to you as a brand, how you can design an experience in the most impactful way so that it's just dead clear in a consumer's mind, like that's for me, I get it, I want it. Well, that takes an understanding of consumer attitudes. And I'm just gonna drive this home with two very quick examples. You know, Barack Obama, Dennis Rodman, similar ages, both black. I, when I was doing my research for this, found out that they were both once, well, Obama still, but married to women named Michelle. Demographically, they would show up as pretty similar, but they've made a few different choices in their lives. And that's why getting to the root of attitudes matters. You know, one more quick one, if I get a little bit outside my generational comfort zone, you know, Billie Eilish, and Greta Thunberg, same age, same race, same sex, both single, but quite different attitudes, needs, and values. So segmenting on attitudes, it provides a way for us to understand what a group of customers care about and ultimately how we can build an emotional connection with them. And within those attitudes too, it's not, you know, what do you think of this brand, this product, this offer? It's about the higher order, the more meaningful, more fundamental things like how do you see yourself? How do you express yourself? How do you connect with your community? How do you think about health and wellness? And so that's what we really strive to dig into. And so as we go through our findings today, um, we're gonna share you know, a number of segments that we normally see and talk about them in detail, but I want you to start thinking about one question, which is when you think about your target customer for your business, or if you don't have one defined, think about kind of your typical or your perfect customer and start to get to terms with and think about what might've changed for them, what attitudes and values did they hold before the world went topsy-turvy that might be challenged right now because it's only by understanding that that you can map out how to respond. It's easier said than done. So let's talk a little bit about the how. Um, I'll walk you through how, how we do it. In April, we launched our first study. It was a 10 minute survey, 5,000 respondents uh, across North America, cleaned and weighted the data, got it so it was representative of the North American population. And to make sure that our uh, survey was uh, as efficient as possible, we leveraged our experience uh, doing segmentations across numerous categories, industries, and business situations. So, you know, put another way, we've done this enough times under so many different circumstances that we kind of already have a good knowledge of the types of attitudes that really tease these customers apart. So the attitudes and values we measured 
were carefully chosen and crafted with a focus on the things we know to be meaningfully delineating and differentiating between different types of customer mindsets. And what we've done since then is two more waves of research with a significant overlapping question in, in the questions we ask, so we can track impact over time and shifts in attitudes over time and understand what looks permanent, what was maybe an acute uh, attitude shift that's receding, and so on. And in those later waves, we also did deep dives, um, first into food, because you know, think about your own eating, cooking, your grocery shopping habits. You're probably cooking at home more. You may be a little bit more nervous at the grocery store. There's a lot that is happening in that space right now. And then second, into a, a broad bucket that we loosely term self-expression, uh, but this is really what's happening in terms of how we uh, express ourselves through apparel, through beauty, and through our appearance. Um, I would put good money that somebody on this call right now is wearing dress shirts and, and shorts. Um, you know, I have got a very different relationship with, with my hair than I had pre-pandemic. Leon's got his hand up. Um, so look, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of what we did. And where we focused our study was on three different areas of, of questions. We knew first and foremost that we had to ask consumers questions about themselves. What are their preferences? They, how do they spend their free time? What stresses them out? What brings them joy? And of course, you know, shopping preferences sit within that. And then we asked them about their attitudes to others. Like, do you prefer socializing or are you more of an introvert? Are you a planner, a leader, or a follower? We actually asked everyone the, the planner question, I think, or the, we asked one of these questions, and I'll get to that in a second and tell you guys where you showed up. Uh, you know, are you altruistic? Are you self-oriented? And then last, about attitudes towards brands and organizations. Not at the specific brand level, like do you like it or not, but what kinds of organizations do you trust? Who do you want to interact with in which, which circumstances? And so on. And last, we ran that all through our filter of the segments we always see. There's always a price sensitive segment, so we knew we needed to ask about that. There's always a planner, an achievement oriented group, there's always a follower group and so on. So long story short, we went at a very specific pointed set of attitudes that we know tease customers apart. And that let us set up spectra like this one. And this is actually the one that we asked you guys about in, in the pre-survey. So thanks to everyone. Who, uh, who submitted, you'll be interested to know that it is virtually a, a, a half and half split. I think it was 56% uh, were more into trying new things and 44 were on the other side of it, but pretty evenly split among this group. And so look, in this case, the spectra, right? It's about trying new things or um, uh, sticking with what you're familiar with. I, I'm personally, I think a bit on the, the right-hand side. And what we do is we, we ask this across a whole set of values. This is a, a subset of five. Uh, there were 25 that actually had influence on the segmentation. So this is just an illustrative uh, subset. And we can start to look at our segments and plot them along these dimensions of what they actually, the attitudes they actually hold. This is a segment we call the adventurer. And you can just very plainly see that they, they skew towards the right on dimensions of discovery, pushing the boundaries and being social. And when we did this across the entire sample of 5,000 consumers, there were eight segments that popped out for us. And at the risk of stating the obvious, Segments are caricatures. You know, of course, as individuals, we might change our preferences based on occasion, or you know, we might say something that might be true for us now, but maybe not later. But the thing is, it's basic psychology that we all actually hold a caricature, a model of ourselves in our own brains. Sometimes it's aspirational, sometimes it's more harsh and critical, but you know, we respond to messages, offers, and experiences that speak to that caricature, to that ideal or uh, archetype that we have of ourselves. So even though it's a simplification of a really complex situation, this is a powerful uh, tool for achieving what we wanted to do, which is to design and create experiences, offers, products, services, and ultimately brands that connect with how people see themselves and how they want to be seen, particularly when there's change afoot. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to the segments and then we'll start to talk about what's actually shifted for them. And a quick disclaimer, Obviously, the names and descriptions, they're a characterization from the data. There is a ton more richness behind the, and it's in the research reports I mentioned earlier. Very happy to discuss further or share with you uh, beyond the webinar. Just, just reach out to us. Quick blast through the segments. Our largest segment is the, what we call the planner. They're a comfort-seeking segment. They value routine, the familiar. They're a little cautious, a little less social, and generally a bit more reserved. So they're not an early adopter they're gonna to gravitate towards brands like, you know, Subaru and Toyota, not Tesla, or Apple, not Android, Banana Republic, not Everlane. The Good Samaritan, our next segment, it's actually, a, it's a great name for them. Um, they're social, but it's very altruistic. They gravitate towards the familiar, they're pretty rule following, 
and they like to do things themselves. So these are the guys like in your life that you would call if you needed help moving, uh, for example. Um, it's the segment that brands like Allbirds or Toms are targeting. They're also a really good target for local businesses that have a, a community or a, or a charitable, a charitable bent to them. Uh, the budget conscious, right? This is our price sensitive segment. That's the headline. We always see a version of the segment in our work. Um, but behind the, just the headline, they're also a bit more fragile. They're prone to worry. They're not likely to take chances. They stick with the familiar and uh, they're a bit more introverted than extroverted. So this is a brand uh, or a segment rather that your targets of the world, your Walmart, they're obviously built for these guys. But interestingly, um, so are more tech forward brands that are about transparency and easy decision making and easy to understand product features. That, that really is in the wheelhouse for this, this segment. The Achiever is the, it's actually the segment that I fall into. I think it's a flattering headline for them. They're independent rule breakers. They value being self-sufficient, uh, but they kind of like their alone time and they feel a sense of accomplishment doing things themselves. And they're also more likely to hold others to a high standard. So they're a bit of a lone wolf with a, a bit of an attitude. And this is the brand that Nike and Rolex, those types of brands are trying to appeal to because the brands themselves, you know, they're pushing you as an individual They're And as a mirror for that, they're also independent brands that tend to march to the beat of their own drum, break the rules of what's expected. And that's exactly what the achiever is going to respond to from a business. The connector, they're the flip side. They are social, they're about relationships, they're rule followers, they value time with friends and family, and they're positive, thoughtful, and tech savvy. So if you have a friend uh, who was first on Instagram or is telling you to get on TikTok, decent chance they might fall within this segment. I've already hit on the adventurer a little bit. Uh, they do what they stay on the tin. They're about discovery, pushing the boundaries. Also a very social segment. Um, this is the brand that like Patagonia and GoPro have been targeting for years. Uh, and interestingly, if you haven't been following what Patagonia has been doing uh, on their website, the slow transformation into a content company, do yourself a favor and check it out. It's very, very cool. And it's directly at engaging this customer at a point when we can't engage in the store physically. So they're doing a really incredible job uh, staying relevant and engaged uh, when the fundamentals of their business are being challenged. The time saver, they're a convenience seeker. They value the predictable, doing things as a group. A little bit unlike some of the other conservative segments like the planner or the budget conscious, they're willing to try new things if it's gonna make their lives easier. So these are the type of customers who are probably early adopters and heavy users of Uber Eats, Fiverr, TaskRabbit, grocery delivery services. And bringing us home, the last segment, the eighth segment, the trend seeker, they're all about discovering new things, but they're not a, uh, uh, um, they're not a, a first mover. They're a fast follower. Um, they're keen to shop in multiple locations. They enjoy that experience of finding just the right thing. So this is the segment that right now is probably doing a lot of browsing to find the perfect uh, mask to wear out in public to, to demonstrate their individual style. So very quick blast through eight segments with eight different mindsets. But here's the cool thing, right? We can actually tie each of these uh, segments to, these are category agnostic. We've been through the, the rigor of tying these to um, what you might be focused on in your business or your category. You know, for example, these segments uh, really popped when we looked at attitudes towards food in terms of different reactions. When we asked about self-expression, think you know, apparel and beauty again, um, we were missing a dimension around whether I get dressed up for myself or whether it's to show affiliation with a movement or a group um, that I wanted to affiliate with. It's, that's really important in the self-expression space, but we were able to add that in. So um, you know, if you have a segmentation already, uh, or even if you could describe your target or perfect customer, we can adapt these insights to what's changing because of COVID to that description. That's just the table setting. Let's get into what really matters. Um, each of these segments did have a different reaction to what's going on. So I'm gonna take us through that right now. You know, first up, we obviously wanted to understand how the pandemic is impacting people's lives. And what we learned was very few consumers have kind of come through this pandemic, quote unquote, you know, unscathed. In fact, at first, in the very first wave, back at the beginning of, of, uh, of late April, it was, nearly half consumers uh, said they'd been severely impacted. But interestingly, in the second wave, which was about three weeks later, we saw that number drop by a, a statistically significant amount. But it's held steady since then. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like at first, there's more uncertainty, more to figure out. But if, once you get through that stuff, you kind of settle into something that feels more normal. This is going to be a fascinating number to watch as things continue to reopen. It's also probably not news to you though, because this has been reported elsewhere. What is interesting is how it plays out for different segments, because there is a difference. 
the, the planner and the budget conscious said they were actually less impacted. Really interesting for the budget conscious being a worrying segment, but I think that's just because their baseline worry was actually higher even before the pandemic. And then the time saver and the trend seeker say they've been more impacted. And it's this type of deviation that you can already start to say where you may need to do more or less handholding and support if your customer falls into one of these segments. In addition to understanding the overall impact, we ask consumer perspective on how they're coping. Are they struggling or are they handling it well? Or somewhere in between. Again, kind of polarizing results, right? Nearly one in five consumers, they're in a bit of an enjoyment phase uh, at the beginning. That's actually grown. But we've got a equivalent portion at the bottom saying, I'm really struggling to figure out how to live my life right now. Um, you know, so the, the largest group in the middle, that, that learning phase, they're figuring out how to cope with the distribution. But when we see a distribution like this, you know, as a, as a business leader, how do you act on this, right? Like, it doesn't tell you what to do because the distribution is such that if you're thinking about all consumers, this gives you no guidance. And that's where, again, the segment specific deviations can help. The Good Samaritan and the Achiever, well, they're handling the segments pretty well, or the, the situation pretty well, but the budget conscious, the trend seeker, and the time saver, well, they're struggling. And let's dive deeper into that because I think this is where it gets really interesting. We actually ask consumers to rank what's been most impacted, what's least impacted, and we can do what's called the max diff uh, analysis on that. And it basically, the vertical line and the dots on it, they just show you top is most important, bottom is least important, and the difference between the dots is kind of the relative importance between them. And so quite clear, right? Shopping habits are, are at the top. For this group on the line, you guys actually said travel was the most impacted and shopping was the second. So I think also pretty interesting, interesting there. Um, when we look at this by segment though, it again starts to get really interesting. Sure, there are some that kind of follow the, you know, the, the macro trend, but the budget conscious, the thing that's most important to them, their mental health. And the time saver and the trend seeker, it's about financial stability. So again, you know, pretty powerful in terms of helping you form your reaction. If you can get beyond the headlines and say, I know what my customer cares about. Now, before we dive into an example, just to really bring that to life, it is worth noting that there is stuff that's just true across all segments. It's the stuff that's kind of the new macro tre trends and, and table stakes. So, you know, they'll be a little obvious, but I do want to spend some time on, on the implications for them. First up, uh, across every single segment, digital is the primary form of communication. They all told us that they've seen a significant rise in their belief that technology is essential for staying connected with others. And that's not surprising because just about, you know, every company has leaned into having a digital presence and offering. But most of that's been about fulfillment. And, you know, most consumption through the pandemic has been fulfillment purchases. Consumers are buying things or, or you know, buying what's available to fill a need. But what about discovery occasions? You know, discovery was sort of starting to happen online prior to the crisis, but most of us were still browsing in store to try on or discover something new. Now, the in-store experience might be starting to recover. We've seen, you know, some promising signs from the U.S. in terms of retail sales in May, but there's a non-zero chance that we might go through a holiday season without the ability to browse freely in stores if there's a second wave. So getting discovery and engagement right virtually needs to happen beyond just fulfillment. Um, you know, Proper Cloth is a good example here. They're offering virtual consultations for tailored clothing. Uh, Cigna Jewelers, through their Kay's, Zales, and Jared banners, they're actually connecting you to store managers for virtual store tours. That type of live streaming much more common in China, but it does have a lot of potential in North America. You know, more of our a few of our colleagues, this is a, a great example. Um, they're obsessed with a cleaning company in Calgary called Go Clean. Um, when they couldn't get into people's homes to clean, they started posting detailed things about like how to clean your washing machine, and they've actually developed a national following. Second, consumers are becoming more self-sufficient. Um, they're doing more for themselves. They wanna keep doing more for themselves. 91% of consumers, for example, said they were gonna continue cooking at home more once the pandemic was over. That's remarkable. And for many, it's been a forced thing, but we also see in the data that there's an enjoyment element to this. And so, you know, Tim Hortons does decorate your own donuts. Ikea has told you how to make their meatballs at home. The keg does a celebration kit to recreate the keg experience at home. Give consumers, you know, lean into it and give consumers the chance to recreate the benefit that otherwise they would get, um, you know, from you. And third, brands are expected to play a larger role. I know we're going to talk about this one a lot more because across all segments, they told us that brands should be more held accountable for their actions. They'll be more likely to hold brands accountable for their actions. And of course, recently there's been incredible scrutiny about how brands and companies um, have been both treating their employees, but also, you know, reacting to what's going on in the world. So we've seen, you know, rocket fuel 
report on this in the last two weeks with the Black Lives Matter movement, you look at Ben and Jerry's, Nike, uh, Yorkshire Gold Tea, Peloton Glossier, you know, they've, they've really created new engagement by authentically standing for something. But on the flip side, you think about Bon Appetit, Hearst Publishing, Amazon, L'Oreal, Disney, The Wing, they've all been called out for not really walking the talk and kind of just saying stuff that doesn't actually align with how they run their business. So standing for something isn't just an external expression, it's an internal thing too. Okay, let me just race really, really quickly through a few more slides because I know we want to get to the Q&A. If we've been, so I've been hammering it since the beginning, right? If you're built for everyone, you're built from, for no one. Of course, you'll get sales from every segment or any segment, but a sharp strategy requires getting a clear focus on the segment you're designed for. This is the construct we use in our work. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it, and it's, it's simple, but it's powerful because of that. What I want you to focus on is the top of the pyramid, because the best strategies are the ones that, you know, have focus and clarity, and then the ones that just put one customer description at the top. And that's hard because as business leaders, we get into the yeah buts and the how abouts and we try to build Franken segments that give way too much wiggle room to decision making in the business. So it's a trap. And I'm going to show you what I mean. We're going to take two of our segments, the trend seeker and the good Samaritan. I'm just going to walk you through how if you're a trend targeting the trend seeker, you would react very differently than if you're going the other way. They're both social segments, just to remind you, but they have different drivers beyond that. The Good Samaritan sticks with the familiar, the trend seeker is about discovery. The Good Samaritan's a rule follower, the trend seeker isn't afraid to bend the, bend the rules in the right circumstances. And the trend seeker is much more likely to be a shop, uh, okay shopping around. So you can already see you'd start to shape pretty different responses depending on who you're targeting. And that's where it gets really, really interesting when we look at what's shifted for these segments during the pandemic. Recall that the trend seeker was most likely to be impacted and struggling, you know, being isolated is having an impact. They're actually twice as likely almost to say there's been an impact on their health and well-being than other segments. And as a result, they want to become more self-sufficient. But though they say that, they're also kind of paralyzed and having a harder time making decisions. But they're excited to get back to things of like dressing up, getting a haircut, buying nicer things. So if you're a brand that's targeting the trend seeker, you know, a few tactics already start to, to jump out. Obviously, a tremendous opportunity to build a platform for self-expression that provides inspiration and sharing. And in fact, it's already there. It's called Instagram. So this becomes about seeding content and encouraging a two-way dialogue, getting the, your customers to become your brand advocates to share. Some brands are doing this really, really well already. There's also a product opportunity here, um, and it line, it's in line with what a lot of brands do, but with a twist. Um, this customer, you know, it's, it, it's about having unique items, but also being really explicit about the use case because this customer is a bit paralyzed in decision making. I'm going to share just a couple examples of folks that are doing this well. Uh, Reka Vodka, um, they do a beard of the week contest. They've been doing this since the beginning. And really what they've done is started to seed out themes for beards and they've done that to the bartender community. And so they've got this beautiful Venn diagram of an attitudinal segment, a category appropriate demographic and a COVID response. And I'll place good money that you'll see a lot of bearded bartenders serving you know, Reka in the near future. Um, this tactic of building a, a platform for self-expression, it's not just a customer facing one either. Reformation, which is a, a sustainable clothing brand, um, they basically turned over the keys for how their product shows up to their employees. So it creates, creates a tremendous amount of engagement and turns employees into brand advocates. And sticking in apparel for a minute, uh, Roots, you know, they, they've leaned heavily into uh, face masks as an accessory. A, a pretty obvious example of unique product and a clear use case. Uh, I'll give you one more, uh, Majuri, they're a DTC jewelry company. They recognize that the trend seeker would be particularly hard hit by all the mystications like birthdays, weddings, graduations, and so on. So they created lines specifically for those missed events. They very directly paired a unique product with a compelling story and use case. It's exactly what the trend seeker uh, is looking for right now. And just to bring it home, the Good Samaritan in contrast, look, they've handled the pandemic reasonably well. They're an other-oriented segment, so that's being sharpened through this. They're more likely to say that they want to engage in charity and they feel more responsible for others. And what they're looking forward to getting back to is, um, you know, very social things like going to new gatherings, uh, dining out, and et cetera. So, you know, what are the opportunities? Well, they're pretty straightforward for this, this segment. Um, you know, this is about supporting social causes, uh, letting them participate in the general social, generating social benefits and showing up for a way that kind of focuses on the positive. This is about, you know, being part of, or better yet, the cause of a positive outcome for these consumers 
in their communities. So when Allbirds, for example, offer up, you know, the, um, the chance to donate a pair of shoes to healthcare workers or Aris gives a watch away to, to COVID heroes, that really resonates with this segment. Um, you know, Staples Connect, for example, uh, they knew the company they wanted to engage with, so they cre proactively created a digital hub full of resources and supplies to engage working and learning from home uh, at a time when people are, are facing re very real challenges with that. So those examples resonate with the Good Samaritan because they're, it's the business saying, look, we know the role we play in your life and in your community, but, and we care about that community too, and we know where you're struggling, so we can help see you through it. So now you have a really clear idea of if you know who your customer is, you'll be able to track their attitudes and values and how they're shifting, and that's where the opportunity lies. So you'll ultimately win some share while it's up for grabs. Joe, do you want to just, just bring us home real quick on this last slide? Yeah, what I, what I would say is, uh, as Stefan is explaining, if, if, you, um, if you are at risk of missing it, uh, it's a fundamental, you know, don't design your proposition and your customer experience for everyone. Get really, really specific about who you're for, what they care about deeply, and what's changing with them. And then, you know, as we believe um, in our firm, you know, having that kind of depth of understanding, that clear focus, you remember the, the customer hierarchy, you know, which customers are we going to own? Are we going to design everything for our value prop, our total experience and how we engage? And then, you know, set your path while you're considering other customers and what they might need. You're focused on the ones that you believe that you can own and be the most to. And then, look at your entire business and every decision you make through that lens. You know, we, we say half of strategy is which customers are you focused on and what do they care about? The other half is what are you doing to tap into what they deeply care about? Not just selling stuff, uh, but, but uh, appealing to, you know, values and mindsets that matter more. And then, you know, moving forward, not on a kind of big bet basis, but to, say, we know these things, we, we understand um, our customer's value, we don't have it all figured out, let's not bet the farm, let's just start to test and learn, let's be scrappy, let's be bold in the way we put things out there. What we know with you know, our client engagements as well as um, beyond is so much of that is happening that I actually think the pandemic and the implications of the crisis are creating the conditions for what will become a golden age of innovation and creativity. Uh, strangely, uh, the silver lining of, of a very difficult time. But test and learn is at the heart of how do you move a business forward once you've got that clarity on which customers are you for. And, and then finally, you know, as you, as you move down this path of customer understanding and focus, and then you get to, wow, we're really learning more as we put things in motion. How do we then take those uh, lessons, those, those deeper understandings, those uh, evidence-based initiatives, and start to use them to refine our strategy. All right, uh, Leon, I, I think we're ready for, for Q&A. Apologies. For yeah, me. no, that's great. So I'm going to ask people to definitely start putting in your, uh, your questions here. We've got about just over 20 minutes to do some Q&A here. Before we head into the Q&A portion of this webcast, first, a brief note about PO Leadership from one of our members. At PO Leadership, I'm surrounded by other business leaders who challenge me to become better. Les Mandelbaum, founder and CEO of Umbra. Leaders really need to step outside their world and get new perspectives. PEO Leadership is more than peer-to-peer -peer advisory. It's a community of top executives with global experience. Our retail landscape is rapidly changing. PEO Leadership has been vital in helping us navigate through this. The time to step up and lead is now. Go to peo-leadership.com. Joe, I'm going to ask you as people are putting this in for it, uh, one of the questions I've got, retailers, because a lot of the individuals here are, probably have consumer products, they've got brands, but they're probably delivering into the retail system. When you think about permanent versus temporary changes as a result of this COVID-19, you're on the front lines there. Do you, what can you tell us? What do you think are going to be some of those permanent changes? And what do you think are going to be some of the temporary ones that will rebound by 2021? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the first um, and most profound implication of all of this is uh, what we 
describe as a retail reckoning. You know, the reality of retail, broadly speaking, has been um, longstanding, what I'd call legacy businesses um, in a marginal position um, for a long, long time. And marginal in the sense that um, often they're trading dollars. Uh, they don't sell things um, or in ways that are uh, different from their competitors. Uh, a lot of times because they're long-standing businesses, they've got legacy real estate. That, re that real estate that might've been tier one, you know, 30 years ago is now tier two or worse. Um, and they've got, um, you know, uh, uh, in most cases, a lagging position relative to the way customers today, technology enabled customers wish to shop. And, and so I'm speaking of sort of not the disruptors that have, have you know, taken the stage recently, but more the, you know, the big players. And so all of those things have caused um, this pandemic to really bite. And, and I think that's worth um, noting. Well, you know, look at the bankruptcies, the failures that are going on, the, you know, people struggling, there's both sides of the equation. I think you could say, look, if you're a supplier to them, that can be very difficult because you can get, you know, cents on your dollar for your inventory that's already gone over to them. Um, not an easy spot to be. But the good news, the silver lining of this is because the marginal players are falling, we're going into bankruptcy and being forced to deal with stuff they should have dealt with a long time ago, uh, restructuring debt, um, you know, the degree to which they're operating with, you know, real estate that is boat anchors on their P&L instead of, you know, really highly productive. Um, those things need to be deal with. What's going to emerge, of course, will be some failures. Absolutely. We've already seen some of those and there'll be more to come. But also those that have the wherewithal, they go into trouble, they retool, and they come out maybe a little smaller, but definitely a lot more, you know, fighting fit. And they get on with digitizing. They get on with, you know, the work of digitizing, uh, uh, in meaningful uh, ways to engage with customers and then fundamentally differentiating who they are. You know, last time I checked, and I'm sure the audience would agree, you know, interchangeability is not a successful strategy. And I think a lot of retailers and CPG companies got away with, you know, we're in the consideration set, we're okay. But, you know, fundamentally, if your tiebreaker is price, you don't have a strategy. You know, you're not setting yourself apart in a unique way that's defensible. And that's why, you know, tying that question to what was just shared, that's why it's so fundamental. Who are we to whom? And therefore, how can we design a value prop and a highly differentiated offering and experience that's going to be sustainable? Um, then maybe a little more granular. Um, look, there's winners and losers already. You know, those folks that are deemed essential um, obviously have a better time of it. Anything that's discretionary. Um, fashion is, is hugely hit, any, anything in that uh, self-expression uh, domain. But the way I like to think of it is while we've all been pinched um, in some way or another, you know, restaurants that have been closed, dormant for a while, it's causing us to play catch up fast and also to do workarounds, to be scrappier in the way we get at things. And it's funny, I talked to a CEO yesterday and uh, he said, you know, our four-year plan was to hit a milestone in penetration of e-com and digital direct uh, relationship with customers, including a richer, deeper engagement. He said, we hit that four-year plan in five months. And so now the question becomes, well, what next? If that's our starting point, and look, we may see some things recede. You know, the penetration of e-com and retail across the board has gone up dramatically. We may see that come back. But the consensus in our community and in our data is that won't go back. It won't go back to what it was. So now the question is, it's a, it's, we're standing on new ground. How do we leap off it towards um, the future and new possibilities? Oh, that's great. It's funny you mentioned that story. We, we've seen that within our membership as well. I mean, we talk about Mila. Mila, I did a snippet with. Same thing. Five-year digital strategy, first last three months, boom. Loretta meets, same thing. Everybody just driving really, really quick, being agile. Yeah. I'm going to go to uh, some of the questions here. Nick, are you on and you want to come off mute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Thanks, Leon. Uh, Stefan, Joe, thank you very much for the presentation. Phenomenal. 
I just really had a question around expectations of the consumer, particularly in this new world of digitization, mobility, et cetera, that how do you balance off the communication process uh, between personalization and mass? So even if we look at segmentation, they're fairly large groups, but I think as a consumer now, the expectation is you're gonna to talk to me personally. So how, how do you balance that within the environment you guys present? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, it depends so much on the, the business itself and, and its scale and its wherewithal. Um, I think that what we're finding so encouraging is let's take uh, text communication between those on the customer service or sales side and customers themselves. You know, there was a rule, almost uh, an unwritten rule in some consumer businesses that, well, our frontline folks don't share their mobile information with customers because we need to control the brand experience and there needs to be, you know, data platforms and, and all that stuff for that to happen. Along comes COVID-19, people are struggling to just replace revenue that's lost. And a lot of those barriers have come down. So I think we, we got into, particularly if we're talking about mid-size or larger businesses, we got into this mindset that everything has to be you know, platformed. Everything has to be sort of completely figured out and buttoned down and risk-free. And I think that's gone away and that's a good thing. I think it's much more, look, there's always variability that you don't want in any customer experience, but giving it over to customers and saying, look, we can serve you in, in new ways. Me as an individual representing the brand I'm part of is just a powerful unlock and it doesn't need to be formal. That's what, that's what I would say. So personalization fundamentally in scale is about data and it's about algorithms and, and all of that that's really, really valuable and, and, and I would argue necessary today. Um, but it, it can be a much, much lower tech, um, you know, version that does every bit as well. Yeah, I, I, and just to, to layer on there, I think that, you know, the dividing line comes from um, personalization shows up in the tactics uh, you choose. It shows up in your store level interactions. It shows up in um, what products you choose to put forward. The, the design, though, of the, the way you show up, where you show up, and what you mean to customer, th that's where we the segmentation and the attitudinal part uh, really gives gives some power uh, because you want people to have clarity over you know what you stand for but then tactically make it feel like okay if they get me it's a it's a personal interaction yeah it's a, it's a great ad um, like alignment equals power right alignment as stefan is alluding to you know you're going to experience it in this channel it, you know when we talk about ourselves and what we're doing for the world you're going to hear the same things. If it comes from the same center, it has a, a chance of amplifying. You know, aggregating around a common theme equals power, equals traction, equals I know who they are. I know who they are to me. And uh, that, that, that's a multiplier. Um, next question. Uh, love Teresa. to cover a bit more ground. Yeah. Teresa, do you want to come off mute? <clears throat> sure. I'm, I'm wondering in terms of the work that you've done. I mean, everybody was so focused on COVID and, and how people were experiencing and dealing with it um, that, you know, all of a sudden a huge social issue uh, got, you know, the spotlight that it has so desperately deserved for such a long time. Um, but with it brought very similar things like mental health issues and, and the, the impact of it. And you talked a little bit about, you know, your segments that are looking for brands they trust or brands that stand for something. Is, are you seeing in, in the research you're doing or in the groups that you're dealing with a major shift from a custo customer focus? Is there a lot of difference between COVID and Black Lives Matter issues? Yeah. Yeah. And within Black Lives Matter's issues, are they expecting something particular from brands in terms of the positioning that they take? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, first thing to say is that these things are not um, unrelated. Uh, what we saw in the first waves of data, um, as Stefan uh, highlighted, was I need the brands that I deal with to be more transparent, to be clear about what they are for, and to deliver that, to actually walk the talk. And the bar raising in that regard is I don't, you know, products, services, functional stuff I can get anywhere. That's the reality today. 
who are you? What do you stand for? What are you, what are you doing to take care of me as a customer, but also your own employees? And so when you look at um, the, the social uh, unrest that's taking place um, with regard to social equity and Black Lives Matter, that is a continuation of that. That isn't just sort of a net new, you know, let's forget that part. So that's super important to understand because I believe one of the reasons that this um, degree of social embrace as well as unrest is because people are doing what Stefan told in his little story about his family and his young uh, child and, and his partner. This moment is causing us to re-examine fundamentally, not just what we do and how we behave, but the values on which those decisions are made. And so, you know, I, I believe I've, I, I was at a um, conference in November in Toronto, back in the day we could all gather in a physical space. And um, I spoke to a group at Elevate Tech Fest. And that was the first time I started to talk about, you know, the emergence uh, of the values economy. You know, if you look at brands that are starting to move forward in powerful ways, powerfully uh, connecting with customers, with humans, it is not on the basis of value, you know, quality over price or access. Today, more and more, the drumbeat is towards values. And COVID-19 has accelerated that. And I actually think, you know, I, I was saying, I think this is going to be the golden age of creativity and innovation. I also think it's going to be the golden age, painful for sure, challenging, not fast in some ways, but the golden age of um, so social equalization. Just simply because we've just had this massive shock to our system and it's caused us to think about things differently and more deeply. And, you know, just watch what happens in, in regard to climate change, you know, which has long been, oh, it's an issue, we believe it, we understand it, but not much happens. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but I would say there's going to be a massive social shift in, in terms of engagement on, on that front, just like there is on, on social inequity. Yeah. The, the only other thing I would add to that is just strictly from the pure data. Uh, that's exactly what we see. Most of the values that had a, a spike have receded somewhat. The one that is actually held the most firm was when we asked people, um, I believe, agreement with the statement, I believe organizations need to be held accountable for their decision. Um, you know, more, do you believe that more or less? Uh, it's consistently being over half of consumers and it hasn't really budged. So I, I think that just backs up exactly what Joe's saying in the data. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Alan, can I come up, uh, get you off uh, mute and have you ask your question as well? Yes, Alan is the name of my wife, but I <laughs> under her name. My name is Joel <laughs> and I'm calling from Europe. But my question is, in Europe, we see that governments um, tend to do the opposite of what would be natural in the, under these circumstances. So the market would uh, prefer the agile uh, companies, but the, com the governments tend to, uh, to support the, the ones who, are, who were not ready for this uh, situation. And that's, in fact, contrary to what you uh, were referring to, uh, Joe. Well, I, I, it's such a, a great point to raise, and thank you for joining us uh, from, from Europe. Um, look, governments are, are lagging consumers um, in so many ways. Um, you know, I, I would reference an Edelman uh, study done last year that said people have stopped believing that they can count on governments to do all manner of things, to lead social change, to... Um, to prepare themselves for the new economy, et cetera. And they're interestingly looking at themselves and their individual responsibility or community responsibilities, but they're also looking to businesses. In fact, uh, I'm trying to cite the stat, but you know, close to 60% of consumers in the Edelman study said that we believe brands like businesses, commercial constructs will actually be more likely to, to lead the way than uh, our governments, local, uh, you know, state or provincial and federal. And I, I think that's a massive shift. We have to pay attention to, you know, politics has always been driven to some degree by individuals and their collective choices. But we're seeing something that, you know, the mobilization of consumerism towards values 
is a phenomenon that I think is going to reshape much, much of the world. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, a strong proponent of governments these days. I think most of them are making very odd choices uh, and, and not really practical. And they're not getting on with what is next. Uh, they're sticking in the past. And look, those days are gone. Uh, so, but that's probably another seminar entirely. <laughs> Again, it's one of the things that we asked about was, um, do you believe your government's going to do what, what's right? And in the first wave of research, that was the only value that customers said they were less likely to say that. Um, again, just yeah, more driven much more by the United States than by Canada in our study. Um, but just really, yeah, backed up again in the data. It's called media influence from the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's great. Thank you for that question. Beth, are you on the call still? I know you had a question. Yes, I am, thanks. Um, and thanks uh, for that really great content. So my question is, are homes the new fashion in terms of self-expression? People are spending so much time in their homes. They're virtually working in their homes and socializing in their homes. And more people than ever before, like your coworkers, are seeing into your home. So right. does this have long-lasting implications for how we live and also for businesses that can take advantage of this. Yeah, if you look at some of the recent uh, business performance stats, um, you know, home improvement, uh, garden supply, um, you know, all manner of things related to home uh, seem to be growing at a, a tremendous uh, pace. And you know, I think part of it is um, your self-expression now visible uh, as different than before where, you know, people weren't perhaps, uh, or as many people weren't near your home literally as before, um, but also um, safety. This is, this is nesting that's going on and, and nesting fundamentally at a human level is around, I want things to be not only, you know, lovely, and express who I am. I want them to be controlled. I want to, you know, to shape my environment so it reinforces that I'm, you know, I'm in a good place. And, um, and that, uh, you know, I think is, is definitely going to bode well for those in the, in the home uh, business. And also, I mean, if you think about it, some of these other uh, pings on, you know, cooking at home and so on, imagine how much, um, you know, cookware, uh, you know, specialized equipment, et cetera, the engagement with the restaurant community, chefs, uh, on and on and on. I, I, I you know, I, I know that there's been a lot of doom and gloom and there is a lot of doom and gloom, but, you know, there's so much exciting potential. If you just look at what's happening and say, how do I respond to that? How do I do something with that? That would be a value to, to the customers I serve and my business. It's a great question, Beth, thank you. Thank you. Well, we're coming pretty close up. We have one minute before noon here. Um, before I close it up, here's the question. Own the customer, you know, has been a huge, huge thing on one of the boards. I sit with a big CPG company today. Is it more relevant today than ever before now with going through COVID-19 in terms of if you're the producer, you own the brand, you need to own that, that customer? Yeah, I, I, I think it's um, the fundamental question. It's a great place to leave it. Look, I, I, you know, I'm honest with leadership teams that we work with, those that we know well and those that we, we uh, come into contact with. And, and I say, if you don't have a focus, a customer focus that's clear, meaning you're choosing segments of customers to design for, to create for, um, and that's manifest across everything you do, your, not only your voice, but your, you know, your proposition itself, you don't have a strategy. And what COVID-19 is laying bare is, in a time when share is shifting because values are shifting, people are reassessing, who do I wanna, who do I wanna buy from? Who do I wanna be connected with? Who do I wanna be associated with? If you don't have that kind of customer clarity, your business is at greater risk than it need be. And, and I would say, you know, I was on a, a board call with a leadership team last week and, you know, we showed the data that said never before in the history of this category has there been so much market share available. It's going to go somewhere. You know, people are failing. Share becomes free. People are, you know, 
mishandling the COVID-19 reality. Share becomes loose. And if, you're, if you've got your stuff together strategically and you're moving forward at a pace, and by that I mean, you know, customer focus, really, really lasered in, and you know what they care about, you're, the world's your oyster. You know, no, seriously, this is the best, uh, to, to, you know, to start a business, to pivot a business, to take a great business that's good at all this stuff, and then just simply get tight, get focused. Um, there's a lot of value to be created, like a lot of money to be made. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Our and pleasure. This, uh, the insights were fantastic. I apologize to anyone who I pronounced her name wrong. Teresa, it's Teresa. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, how could I say that? Um, listen, for those of you who have just joined us for the first time, if you go visit our site at poleadership.com and you take a look for the way forward or snippets, we've been doing this for the last 12, 13 weeks. There's some great thought leaders there, one hour conversations. Uh, you can see Rosabeth Cantor, you can see Michael Beer, both Harvard professors talking about different things around leadership. Janice Stein is there, one of the founders of the Monk Institute. Uh, and the list goes on. So please do that. Uh, they've all been recorded. And uh, well, I wish you a great rest of the week. It's warm here in Canada. I don't know what you're up. Uh, be safe and have a great weekend. That concludes our session for today. Thank you all. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Bye. Pleasure. Take care. Thank you.